I'm greeting you all in the name of Jesus and Bonani Zitanda Zezulu um Isabatelikle Mtano Bongi Tuba Tinga Pualon Gutungwa Zukulu Mangenda Bezinle Zigas Magade Usoni Nanini Mgalis non Peleli Siwagongo Gulle no Pilai um, my text of consideration is situated in the book of Acts chapter 9 verses 1 to 5. Acts chapter 9 verses 1 to 5. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. He asked for the letters from him to the synagogue at Damascus uh, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Ungulungula busi sukfunda Amen. Verse 1 and verse 2 is actually laying out in plain terms that Saul is unapologetically passionate without patience about persecuting the disciples of God. It should be maintained on our minds that Paul was the student of Gamaliel who was himself a student of Hillel. So, before we begin to enjoy the theological principles kept in this chapter. Now, Hillel in his era was uh, a perfect representation of Judaism and through the process of mentorship, he uploaded himself to Gamaliel who also became a perfect representation of Judaism and through the process of mentorship, he also uploaded himself to Saul, who in his time became a perfect representation of Judaism. So this means that in the person of Saul, Christianity was persecuted by the very essence of Judaism. This suggests that the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ by his disciples was so effective that the existence of Judaism was threatened. I have got to repeat this one so that you may understand the following submission. This suggests that the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ by his disciples was so effective that the existence of Judaism was threatened. This event was establishing what I call the marking rubric for the progress of the gospel in that we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is successfully preached when the existence of the enemy has been threatened. I have got to repeat this one. We know, because this is what I believe this event was establishing. It was establishing what I call marking rubric for progress of the gospel in that we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is successfully preached when the existence of the enemy is threatened. As for as long as the enemy is still covered and comfortable, we have not started to preach. When you hit and it doesn't hurt, then your punch is a massage. I've got to repeat this one. When you hit and it doesn't hurt, then your punch is a massage. In fact, Ellen G. White says our preaching will um, either hasten or procrastinate persecution. <laughs> our preaching will either um, um, hasten or procrastinate persecutions. The problem of Saul is not Jesus. I have got to under I have got to make this um, submission. I'm using the term Christ here as a substitute for the term Messiah, because the term Christ is taken from the Greek word Christos, which means the anointed one or Messiah. So now the problem of Saul is not Jesus Christ. You know, 
the pro the problem of Saul is not the Messiah. Um, but the problem of Saul is the one who is referred to as Jesus Christ. Follow me very carefully. According to Judaism, don't forget that Paul was representing the essence of Judaism. According to Judaism, <clears throat> Jesus Christ is not the son of Mary because the son of Mary comes from Nazareth and there's nothing good that can come out of Nazareth. The son of Mary was born in a manger and the Messiah cannot have royal credentials and be born in a manger at the same time. <clears throat> the son of Mary has never worn a military attire and a sword in his hand. How can he be of David's descent when he is not aiming at waging war against Romans? So the son of Mary didn't match the Jewish criteria of expectations. You see, the problem with Jews is that they are used to understanding God from the Ark of the Covenant, which is two and a half cubits long, a cubit and half wide, and a cubit and half high. They fall into a trap of calculating how God should operate. They prayed for the Messiah and decided amongst themselves as to who he should be, what he should do, who he should associate himself with, and what should he say. This attitude made them to continue praying and answered prayer. You've, I've got to repeat this one. This attitude made them to continue to pray a prayer that has already been answered. I hope you're following this one. Uh, this attitude also reminds me of the tendency that is dominating Christians today. We think that we have a right of deciding on the details and forms of God's answer. For an example, we pray for partners, but we end up deciding on their height, complexion, and background. This reminds me of the adage that says beggars cannot be choosers. According to my own personal um, 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 definition of prayer, which I've experienced throughout my life of prayer, this is the definition I would give. Prayer is retrenching your contributions from God's design. Prayer is retrenching your contributions from God's design. When you pray, from that moment you are simply giving up your anticipation for God's manifestation to take place. Allow God to do things according to his own way. And don't forget that he always has good plans for you. <clears throat> what is disturbing about Jews is that Jesus didn't come to them in mysterious ways. Everything he was, was written in the Jewish Bible. All the prophetic oracles about the Messiah were in their hands, but they failed the test of his coming dismally. Jesus used to ask them as to how do they read. Quite frequently, Jesus would make mention of himself in the scriptures, but still they could not understand. I think I know the problem here. Peter once said to Jesus, when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Jesus, I mean, Peter respond, responded and said, you are the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who was to come. And Jesus said to him, what you have just said to me right now, has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood, by, but by the Spirit of the living God. Follow. This, um, um, uh, this means that, um, or rather, uh, yes, this means that everything about the Messiah was contained in the Scriptures. But the revelation of the scriptures about the Messiah is the work of the Holy Spirit. I have got to uh, recite this uh, submission. This means that though everything about the Messiah was contained in the scriptures which they had in their hands, but the revelation of the scriptures about the Messiah is the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me break this one down. The Jews had the scriptures in their hands, but the Spirit of God was not with them, and therefore they could read without understanding and discernment. We can have the Bible, we can have the writings of Ellen G. White, we can have the church manual and policies, but if we do not have the Spirit of God upon us, 
we will never receive the revelation of Jesus Christ in our lives. We will wear, you will wear a long skate to church with a short temper. We will have healthy diets with sinful records. We will we'll be part finders with no path to find. We will have camp meetings without God camping in our hearts. We need to long, cry, fast, and pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we will never make it towards the second coming of our Messiah. I have got to repeat this one. We need to law, cry, fast, and pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we will never make it towards the second coming of the Messiah. Remember, Skata Seko Makolo, Gosio Musa in Busisa.